And we thought it was a good uh, idea to take a moment at the end of a very long day, many panels. article after article, uh, one of the main things that I do is what the debate is, what is the range of the debate, and where the disagreement lies. It seems to me that in many cases, uh, the, it, when different people are debating issues, the, the split depends on their view of China. China as a partner, China as a rule maker, China as a rule breaker, or perhaps trying to look at how China has seen the issue in and of itself. And that regardless of the areas that we're talking about, whether it's institutions or military modernization or economic ties, that there are always sort of two sides to every story. With international institutions, is it a good idea to involve China as much as possible in these institutions to enmesh them in the current global order, to provide some sort of restraints or shaping of China's choices so that we can have the peaceful rise that all countries are hoping for? Or institutions just leverage for zero-sum purposes, that the more involved China is in international institutions, they're just acquiring a new type of power that they can leverage in their own self-interest to the detriment of other countries. The trade-off also exists in economic ties. Are we in a situation in which Asia, which is now more economically integrated than Europe, that th that, that economic integration is leading to more peace and incentives for stability? Or are we in a situation in which asymmetric power, specifically Chinese um, economic power over its neighbors, are leading to incentives for coercion? You can see in some cases for the former, in some cases for the latter. It seems we also debated today, what do we want? What does China want? Um, do we, does the United States really want a more active China? Would it be good for the United States if China began to define its interests globally? If China, for example, got rid of the non-interference policy that we've heard about before? I always contend, I think that there's many cases in which people would say that it would be better if China um, adapted and was more flexible with non-interference. But then I would also warn and say that maybe U.S. officials that are so used to other countries accommodating U.S. preferences might not be so happy as China becomes more intimately involved in some of the areas that they've currently taken a hands-off approach about. On our rule maker panel, there are many comments being made that sort of showed this two sides. One was that we want China to join international institutions, and we want them to make rules on, one, on, on the one hand, but not at the expense of other countries, on the other hand. Right? To me, there seems to be a very clear tension between all of these issue areas. And on an issue-to-issue -issue basis, we might be able to make judgments. OK, is, is this an area in which China is acting as a partner, or a rule maker, rule breaker? But then you move to bilateral, multilateral, global. You can't do it on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. There's too many permutations and combinations. And so I think this is driving people to try to connect all these behaviors in some sort of overarching theme. We want to know what the strategy is. And we want consistency. We think that there's some sort of playbook that will tell us how we can predict what all countries are going to do in certain situations. Given the stakes that we are currently facing, it seems to me that many people, at least in the United States, if not in China as well, no longer want to cross the river by feeling for the stones. We want to know exactly where every pebble in that river is. And this is, in my mind, an impossible standard. Um, but the purpose of the conference today was hopefully to get us a little bit closer to maybe identify a few of those stones, and at least we have a sense of what we know and what we don't know. So I hope that we achieve that goal today, and those were, um, that's sort of the main goal I had in all of this, is perhaps not only to clarify for our audience members, but even clarify for myself what it is that we are um, currently facing and the challenges and opportunities that we have in front of us. But with that, I'll pass it over to... Oh, great. Do you want me to... No, it's okay. <laughs> um, so I'll just be very quick. Um, 
I am grateful for everyone for coming today. I found it a very useful conference to look at China and all, and all of its complexity. Um, I still remain relatively optimistic um, because in the, we, spoke, we heard today about ideological constraints, how difficult it is for the Chinese when they have non-interference in the five principles of coexistence and hide your capacities and bide your time, et cetera. But above all, the Chinese are very pragmatic. And so there usually is a very cold, hard, cold calculation of Chinese interests in any given situation, but increasingly those are overlapping. And as I said earlier, particularly in places farther and farther away from China, where China simply needs to have peace and stability because it has people on the ground, it has investments and the like. Um, there has been also a bit of a socialization process, which is we work very differently in many ways. Um, and so getting some type of confidence in those areas, places like um, countries in Africa that are undergoing unrest, um, Middle East to a certain extent, um, and even in, in South America, I think there's opportunities. So hopefully by working on those, we understand a bit more about how we work on different things. One thing is, for example, um, we spoke a little bit of, about new type of major power relations. There's a difference in viewpoint. In, in the US, we just want to get going on something. We don't wait for sort of mutual trust to already exist. We, we recognize an opportunity. There's something that we both need to get done, and we do it. And through the process, we create trust. And maybe we'll get to a, a grand concept afterwards, whereas the, the Chinese sort of start with the concept and then work down to the details. These are just things of sort of cultural, um, historical. Um, it's, it's things that can, be, that can be dealt with through further interaction. So based on that, based on the fact that we have a plethora, an increase in non-traditional security threats, everything from terrorism to climate change to drug trafficking to, um, to nuclear weapons, um, I think that we have a, a, a lot of areas on which we can work, and in so doing, not allowing the areas on which we do have differences in, for example, we might have the same goal, but very different approaches, you know, trying to navigate that. But there are situations in which our, our goals and our approaches also diverge, and those shouldn't prevent progress on the, the very many issues on which there are um, ways to move forward. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Dave Maxwell. Um, he's the Associate Director of Georgetown University Center for Security Studies and a Security Studies Program. He's also a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Army, which um, the majority of his assignments, I think, were in Asia. So I'll turn it to you for some of your thoughts on the conference. Thank you, Ariana. And uh, it is, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've really had a great day listening to, uh, I think, some very distinguished scholars and practitioners, which I think uh, from a Georgetown perspective, and specifically from the Security Studies program, uh, we really focus on you know, the nexus of theory and practice. And today, I think the, every speaker uh, was able to uh, demonstrate the synthesis of, of theory and practice. And for our Georgetown students that are here, I think this has been a great opportunity. And so I'd like to thank all of the, uh, all of the speakers uh, who have participated, because I think the information, uh, the ideas, the discussion uh, is very important. It's obviously very timely. Uh, the president is in Asia you know, as we speak. And so uh, I'm thankful for Oriana and Stephanie to, uh, to time this just right. To, to have to given have up our space on Air Force One, really. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but the panels themselves, I think, were very unique. Uh, each of the topics, the themes that Oriana and Stephanie have developed uh, really allowed us to hear, you know, alternative perspectives. Uh, you know, those perceptions and I think sometimes more importantly, the misperceptions. Uh, and we've, we've heard a lot today, a lot of important things about the, the trauma myth complex, and of course, the Chinese dream, China rising versus China rejuvenation, uh, provocative statements from, uh, from James Mulvenon. I, I really like uh, the idea of, uh, of China having to centralize its cyber uh, for the perverse reason that uh, those processes would, uh, would grind it to a halt just as, as it is here in the United States. So I, I think, uh, I think those kind of statements, though, uh, while provocative, are important. Uh, and we've heard much today uh, about keeping our eye on the uh, strategic relationship, the need for effective cooperation, reducing or preventing surprise, uh, and, and again, strategic communications and crisis management, uh, and developing those relationships uh, that will be able to allow us to manage crises and, uh, and maintain open lines of communication. 
Um, I really would like to thank Stephanie and Oriana for their vision uh, and for, for the work that they've done uh, to do this. I think everybody uh, will agree with me in saying that this is one of the finest conferences uh, that we get here in, in Washington, D.C. I'd also like to thank the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, first of all, for this fine venue uh, and, and just a great day. But uh, it's, it's not, uh, not facilities that make things great. It's really the people. Uh, and the people on the staff of USIP, uh, they deserve uh, a great round of applause. And, uh, and I really uh, appreciate all their hard work. Uh, and to partner with Georgetown and our staff, uh, this is really, I hope, uh, uh, the start of a great partnership for the future. Um, not everybody was here probably all day, and so uh, to those of you that missed the, uh, the earlier panels, uh, which again were excellent, uh, I commend you to uh, the USIP or the Georgetown websites uh, to be able to, uh, to watch these panels. I think that uh, uh, filming these and having these pers for posterity will provide uh, professors uh, and, uh, and students with, uh, uh, with a lot of good uh, material for future discussion and, and dialogue in the classroom and outside of it. But lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Philip and Patricia Bilden uh, and the Asian Security Studies Fund that they've established uh, because their generosity has really allowed USIP and uh, Georgetown to partner uh, to bring this conference together uh, for all of us here. Uh, and so with that, I think uh, we will conclude. And I say thank you for everybody for, uh, for joining us here today. And I'd like to give everybody uh, a round of applause, USIP, Georgetown staff, and Oriana and Stephanie. Thank you.